Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. Good morning. <clears throat> Everybody here? Thank you. Thank you for coming. I seriously mean that. Thank you for having <clears throat> enough wisdom to recognize how much you need to value working on your own relationship with the Lord. But I hope you recognize how much we need every one of you to come. We couldn't do this if it weren't for everyone. So thank you for coming and lending your influence to the corporate body. Your presence helps all of us keep doing what we're doing. So thank you. Bless you. Thanks for serving even by coming. So, <clears throat> and pastor, thank you. He could have canceled this service having heard the first one. <laughs> but he didn't, so I'm encouraged. I don't, I don't know what would have happened if he had canceled. Or he could have just come up with something and sent me home. <clears throat> We're absolutely delighted to be together, thankful for it. And <clears throat> sorry, I've, I'm getting over something, and so if I start doing stuff, just pray. Cough with, if I cough, cough with me, okay? <laughs> just, let's practice. Let's practice. Here we go. <clears throat> Perfect, okay, because I hate being the only one who's gagging up here, all right, and the water doesn't do one bit of good, I've practiced, it didn't work, so, <clears throat> so I'm sorry for that, but here we go, um, I, when Pastor Chris asked me to come, uh, I really wanted to talk about parenting, I really did, because I'd love to give you a long story about why it's so important to me. Other than that, I studied six years how to make disciples, and then I would talk about it, that the only way to do it in our culture really is through the family unit, because the church can't begin to do what kids need. Parents have to understand that they are the formal and informal, intentional and unintentional disciple makers of the children. Your kids all speak English. You're discipling them. They catch on. They pick up to everything. So I really wanted to talk to you about parenting, but <clears throat> decided probably not. Let me just go off on a tangent. We just got back from California doing a parenting conference out there. <clears throat> and um, thank you. So way to go. You get an A. Get, give her a coffee or something. Because uh, she's choking. She's over there gagging. <clears throat> give me a coffee. All right. So, <laughs> so I wanted, uh, it, it, we went to this did a parenting conference in California, just got back. And uh, after the conference, this woman came up to me and her first words were, I want your job. <laughs> that was the first. And, and I didn't know what she meant, but she said, I'd like to take your book and I'd like to upgrade it to the 21st century. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> and, and, and then she said, I don't know what she said. She had a bunch of things she'd like to do. And she, was, she actually changed jobs to take this on as full time. And so in the last... Three weeks, she has been doing these reels and put it on, what's it called? Instagram. Instagram. All right, Instagram. <laughs> what are you laughing about? <laughs> You're supposed to honor your extreme elders. <laughs> oh. oh, good. Well, I'm about there. All right. So anyhow, she did, I talked with her yesterday. She now has 4,200 followers. Then I know lots of famous people who have been trying a long time and don't have near that many. So anyhow, that, that was fun. And I do want to say we, we've run out of our other books, but the, Debbie, there's still some. If Jesus were a parent, there's still some there. And I really mean this. I really mean this. If you can't afford one of those but want one, please take it upon this condition that you'll tell Jesus, you'll promise Jesus to read it. Is that fair? But also tell your pastor that you'll read it. Or at least someone that'll say, are you sure? Are you, are you doing it? You know, it's just, just, just a little help. Is that all right? Is that a deal? Yeah. And if, if, you, if you want one and can't afford it, take one. Deal? Yeah. Okay. We're, we're trying to change the world. Okay, and it's one at a time. Okay, so I, I also was thinking about family series. We work hard and believe a lot in marriage, and so I'm actually going to talk about marriage today, but I want to say every one of you here are married. 
How many people think you're not married? This is a trick. Okay. Well, actually, you might not be. But if you are in Christ, then Christ is in you, and you really are married to Jesus. Guys, get over it. Okay? (laughs) We are the bride of Christ, really. And we'll get into that toward the end of the message. All right? But I do want to talk about marriage. So if you don't mind, would you be willing to stand? I'm going to talk about the two shall become one. And I want to read a bunch of scripture for us. So here we go. And, and this standing really is an honor. If you can't stand, thank you. Bless you. You don't need to. But it's an honor of the Spirit of God who inspired people of God to write God's word to us. We don't have to wonder about if this is God's word. We don't have to wonder, but we've got so much, so much rational evidence for this being the actual message of God from God to us. So we stand in honor. Is that okay? Yeah. Great honor. This, the Bible is a stunning book and worthy of us to. We don't worship the word, but we worship the word who inspired the word. Fair enough? Yeah. Okay, good. So, Here we go. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. That is exactly said by Jesus in John 17. Sanctify them by the truth or be holy by the truth. That it, it starts with truth that we have to believe and obey, and that transforms us from glory to glory to glory, faith to faith to faith. So cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one. The two will become one. And we're going to talk about that today. The two becoming one. All right? And this is a profound mystery, Paul says. I'm actually talking about Jesus and the church. Jesus, thank you that you are present. We don't have to ask you to come. You promise not to leave. But we do need to say we want to honor you. You are present. And I ask you to do for me what I cannot do. I ask you to protect me from saying words that are not from you and to empower me to remember and say what you have said or what you are saying in this moment. Let me be spirit-led as I speak. And I ask you to give everyone here the wisdom to not listen to a human being, but to recognize that the human being is expected to say the very words of God. So we're not dealing with a human being. We're dealing with God. We're listening and responding to God. The word is to become flesh and can become flesh again and again and again and again. So thank you that you will help us. You all agree? Then say amen. Amen Amen. Amen doesn't mean we're through talking with God. Did you know that? Amen means let it be. Oh, sorry. Put on my preacher voice. All right. Thank you. You may be seated. So, uh, at 15, I left home, went away to go to school where my sister lived. And I, I, I had an advantage. I was very short. Really, I was a runt. They, in fact, they called me shorty. But, but at 15, I moved from Montana to Idaho. And in Idaho, you couldn't have a car or drive a car until you were 16. I had my driver's license because I was 15. And I had a car, my sister's. Woo-hoo! And I was cool because I was 15 and a freshman. I had a car and no one else did. Woo-hoo! 
the girls love me so. No, not really. But anyhow, I, that was my dream. Anyhow, so, so I, I, I got to drive a car. But I was away from home. I was totally unsupervised. My supervision was that I lived with a family who were willing to let us come for a little bit of money. I stayed at their home. And, and I had, if I wanted food, I had to show up at the, their times, not at my time. And I had to be in at a certain time that they determined. Other than that, everything in between, I was free. I could do whatever I want. I could do whatever I thought. I could, I could spend the time I had the way I wanted. I could probably get away with murder, and I didn't have anybody watching over me. And, and I could spend money the way I wanted. I mean, I was free. I was single. And then this strange thing, seven years later, I saw her. Wave. Honey, wave. That's, that's the her. Now, if you get acquainted with her, and I encourage you to do it, if you get acquainted with her, you'll see that immediately she looks you right in the eye. And her eyes sparkle, and you feel good just looking into her eyes, sparkling, and she's smiling, and you know what? She doesn't even know you, and without knowing you, she'll figure out 10 good things about you. And she'll tell you, and you'll feel like a million bucks. That happened the first time we met, and I felt like a million bucks. And I said, she better watch out. I'm after her. After three dates, I had my mind made up. She's going to have to run really fast to get away from me. So I kept running. She kept tricking, tripping. I, I found her. I followed her. And pretty soon I asked, and she said yes. And I moved from being single to being married. So I'd heard that being married was really tough. So being very intelligent, I read several books, thought, I can do that. We got married. Everything went perfect till the second Sunday. <laughs> I, I came into the marriage with everything I had. It wasn't much. But what I had included a bedspread. And the bedspread I'd had all my life. And it worked perfectly. It covered the bed, Right? Now, I I didn't tell you that it was worn out and had holes, probably stunk, but I was used to it, so I was fine. So on the second Sunday of our married life, we decided that there was something we needed, and we agreed about that. So we were going to J.C. Penney's. You don't know what that is. It's a store that used to exist. But anyhow, we were going to Penney's. And to get it, and so we're being, I'm a, I'm a male, I'm a hunter, she's a woman, she's a shopper. You know, I didn't know that at the time, but it wasn't in the book. And so I, I was walking along, and all of a sudden, I was alone. <laughs> she ran off already. And then I, I looked, and so I had to slow down and go chase her clear over here. And I said, what's happening? Do you know which department she was in? Bedspread department. You guys are really quick. She, 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 was, she was in the bedspread department, and, and so I'm, I'm saying, what, what's, what's up? And she said, oh, I just, she said, I'm just looking. She held up one of these bedspreads, and she said, what do you think? I said, I don't think anything. I just, what, what, are you, what, are you, what are you thinking? I found out what she was thinking. She was thinking, we need a bedspread. Not me. I was thinking, you're nuts. I don't think I told her. I found out she wanted a bedspread. Not me. I didn't want one. I was happy. You know what else I learned? The two were not one. I mean, everybody thinks that's just about physical. No, no. It's a lot deeper than physical. It was soulless. It was... The two were not one. And so right there in front of God and everyone, <laughs> we had to go to work. How many of you are married? Are relationships work? Yes. Everybody say work. work. Uh, good. All right. Just want to make sure. Uh, I'm, this is really complicated stuff I'm saying. I want to make sure you're with me. So, so right there in front of God and everybody, we began to work on our marriage. She said, yes. I said, you're kidding. Well, probably she said, may we? And I said, "Uh, I don't think it fits anything I'm thinking about. And so in order for the two to become one, we had to have a conversation right there out loud in front of the whole store. And it goes kind of like this. (laughs) 
oh, anybody else been there? We, oh, oh, okay, you understand. This is not new. All right. So finally, the two became one. Now, I really don't remember what we did, but I'm pretty sure. Well, I'm not going to guess. What? Who, who got it? Did, oh, no, I was hoping I gave. Oh, dear. I don't want her to. Well, okay. <laughs> Rationalism won. No. <laughs> so... <laughs> so, oh, do you do marriage counseling? <laughs> okay. So, so anyhow, and, 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 so we got that problem solved. And so the two were one at that point. And then Christmas came. I grew up in a little tiny family. One sister, two parents, me. She grew up in a great big family. Parents, brother, 500 cousins, 10,000 relatives. I don't know. It was a bunch. She would describe what their Christmas was like. A great big Christmas tree. She told me with presents almost covering the tree because they all got together, the big family all got together, big got presents for the uncles and the aunts and the cousins. And, and you know what she thought? She thought we should buy presents for all of her cousins. You know what I thought? <laughs> the two were not one. <sighs> Everybody say work. work. <laughs> so so just, just to make sure you got this tricky idea. Everybody help me. Put up your fingers. Here we go. And practice with me. <laughs> <laughs> and now go. <sighs> it's called rest after you worked. It's called the two have become one at that little tiny particular point. Hmm. <laughs> so, let's go back to the scripture. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Can I say, not without a lot of work? Married couples? Is that all right? Okay. So, it goes on and say, well, this is a mystery. Paul says, but I'm not actually talking about husbands and wives. I'm talking about Jesus and his church. Hmm. Hmm. So, I was spiritually single. Yeah, I was pretty happy. Did what I thought. Did what I wanted. Did what I felt. And then, I heard about Jesus. Jesus. And I don't know exactly when it began to make sense to me, but one day it, I came to my senses and I began thinking, I am as good as I am and I know what I know and I have the strength and power that I have, but if this Jesus really left everything, emptied himself, his position of God, lived a whole life, being one with his father, the two becoming one, the father and I are one, right? You with me? And, and then for being good and doing good, he got crucified, not for his sin, but for ours. And he loved that much to go through all of that to help me do life better. And what he asked of me was to put my trust in him. And that's it. it. Trust him. Well, at that age, that sounded pretty easy and pretty good. So I said, yeah, baby. Oh, I don't know what I said, but, but I said, okay, all right. I'm going to quit being single. I'm going to get married spiritually. I didn't use those words then because I didn't have theology for the biblical knowledge. So I actually changed my mind about who I was going to trust. Didn't have a clue what that meant. But at my young, immature level, you mean just trust in Jesus, put my faith in him? That sounded pretty simple. Okay, I had enough background that I actually, I actually remember, okay, Jesus, I'm going to trust you that you died for me and I can be free from condemnation and shame. We weren't using the word shame back then like we do now, but, but there it was, but I understood the concept. And I said, I'm in. I mean, 
it just made sense. So I changed from being spiritually single to being spiritually married. And, and that was going pretty well until it dawned on me that Jesus actually speaks. He came to live in me by his spirit. And, and there's this interesting thing about Jesus, the Holy Spirit. He always thinks he's right. In fact, he thinks he's not only right, he thinks he's God. And so I learned that he came into my life as light, truth, guide, conviction. He came into my life and he didn't move. He expected me to change. He thinks he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he changes not. And he wants me to do all the work. Can you believe it? Who does he think he is? So, well, the question always was, do I trust him? So what I found out about Jesus was he would come and he would be here and I would be here because I didn't think the way he thought. I thought I did, but I didn't have a clue. And so you know what he would do? He would actually come and behold, I stand at the door, not of the lost, but of the church. <laughs> and he knocks. And I said, yeah, what's up? And he said, well, let's talk. This is what you think. This is what I think. Yeah, well, okay. Okay, I get it. Do you trust me? Ooh, yeah. Well, then you probably need to change your mind and agree with me if you trust me. You're kidding. I did that once. Oh, you did it in general. Now you do it the rest of your life in particular. Oh, really? Huh. Huh. Guess what? Everybody say work. work. If you've been thinking one way all your life, is it work to change your mind? Yes. It's called repent, metanoia, change. Or it's called confession. If you confess, remember, that just means agree with God. Think the way God thinks. So, you got to be kidding. Nope. Oh. He didn't say change your performance. He said change your mind. If you get your mind changed, we'll get your performance changed. Change your, think the way I think. Value what, so Jesus is here knocking. And finally he stays with me until I actually work the muscle of thinking differently than I used to think, thinking his thoughts instead of my thoughts, changing my mind uh, until the two become one at that little tiny particular point. So oh, now we got it all set. Whew. Tomorrow? <laughs> yeah? We talked yesterday, right? Mm-hmm. Today's today. You gotta be kidding. How come you're always right and I'm always wrong? What's the deal? Well, I'm God. Really? Mm-hmm. You want me to change? Mm, that's what you signed up for. You said you trust me. Well, I know, but I mean, that much? Mm -hmm. you know, there's 10,000 more things. <laughs> Wait, we, we're, we're meeting you right where you are today. Everybody, get, let's practice right here. Let's practice being married to Jesus. <coughs> and remember, he comes and helps us change our mind. But he doesn't do for us what he makes it possible for us to do. That would be treating us like total babies. He wants us to grow up, mature. So let's practice again. Here we go. Oh, everybody say, this is, this is work. Everybody say, I'm so glad I'm a Christian. So glad I'm a Christian. With all the work. With all the work. If I had 16 sermons, I could talk about how we've abused the word work and called it legalism, so far from legalism. Most people don't even understand what legalism it seems to me. So anyway, but that's another day. So spiritually married. So let, let me, I gotta hurry because I got carried away a little with that. <clears throat> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Really, how new? I read that. How, new creature, what does that mean? So I ran on, went on, read the next line. All things are passed away. All things are dead, passed away. Behold, all things are new. All things are become new. Wow. Everything? And I tried to think. 
I still have the same parents, still have the same body, still have the same memory. I, I can't even see a lot of things that are new. And then one day, long ago, the Lord helped me to understand something that is, was true for me, may not, that might be just for me, but I'll share it with you in case it makes sense to you. There's something at the very core that is essential and it, it makes everything different. It changes everything about the real you. What's that, Jesus? Well, it's this. Once upon a time, you were born single spiritually. But then you came to know enough about me to put your faith in me, and that began a lifelong journey of you no longer being single, you being spiritually married, and that changes everything. Everything. Everything changes. Well, Lord, what do you mean everything? Well, glad you asked. Let me go through a few things. Here we go. In the old life, I was alone. Amen? Amen. I was alone, painfully or celebratively alone. I, maybe I liked it sometimes, and maybe I didn't. But in the new life, I'm never alone. Jesus, by his spirit, is always with me, so I'm never alone. That has some good, wonderful, comfortable thoughts, but also it carries with it some, <laughs> I'm never alone. <laughs> and the light of the world dwells in me. And when I'm in the dark... You know what comes after? Because we, we would never want God to change his mind to agree with us, would we? That wouldn't be very smart of him. And he is smart. See? So I, I, I'm never alone. That changes everything. Because everything we do comes from our heart. It's not, it's not what we are physically. It comes from inward. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Right? Above all else, guard your heart because out of your heart flows everything you do. So it's not about what I do. It's about who I am and the relationship that's going on inside of me. I'm not alone anymore. There is a real relationship. Everybody, kids, kids like to say to me, they like to say, I don't believe in religion. I believe in relationship. And I like to say, how much relationship? Who does all the talking? How often do you listen? So, I'm never alone. The light of the world dwells in me. And he is love. And he dwells in me. And with him, I have all things. True? It changes everything. So, the old life, I, I made decisions unilaterally. Meaning, I was, I was independent. Did my own thing. New life, bilateral decisions. That means no longer... Do I make decisions on my own? Now I'm married, and I'm not the head. Jesus is the head. I'm the body. I'm not the groom. I'm the bride. And in this relationship, since the groom is always perfect, there's never been a man like this, so ladies, relax. <laughs> well, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. That was probably not from the Lord. But, but here we are. In this new relationship, Jesus is the head. I'm the body. Jesus is Lord. I'm his servant. Jesus is king, master, right? That's who he is. Just as you receive Christ as Lord, so walk in him, Colossians 2, 6. So, whoa, I don't make independent decisions anymore. I now depend on Jesus because my faith is that he probably knows what he's talking about. Would you agree? He's probably right. <laughs> Everybody throw a rock at me. He's always right. Got it? So, no longer am I independent. I have chosen. That's how we're saved, by faith in Christ. That's dependence. Not independence, but I'm married. He lives in me, and I, and I need to learn before I do things to check with the head or check with the group. Jesus, what do you want? Do you know where I got that idea? Jesus told us. That's how he lived. He said, I don't do anything apart from my father. My father's always with me. The father and I are one. I don't say anything. I don't judge anything. I don't come to any conclusion. I don't do anything independently of my father. I'm just telling you how Jesus lived. And he said, follow me. Be my disciple. Learn from me. Come to me. Learn of me. Got it? What are you thinking? Are you awake? 
So dependent. It's hard to be independent. Hard to be dependent. Sorry. Hard to be dependent. Because we were used to being independent. Doing our own thing. It's my part, right? But we have chosen to put our faith in Jesus. Depend on him. Not just, I say just when quote, to die for our sin so that we could legally have forgiveness so that if we would repent, he could come in to change us and save us. That's how he saves us. He dies for us to make it legal for him to come into us and save us one thought at a time, one motive at a time, one value at a time. Make sense? See, it really is all about relationship, isn't it? Because you're not single anymore. You're married. Everybody say, I'm married. If you're a Christian. And, And if you're not, thank you for coming. Thank you. Check it out. Jesus will save your life. I mean it. But he won't force his will, but he'll make possible your victory in life. We can be more than conquerors. Got it? It's big. He'll, he wants to save you. So we, we, we got to learn. We got to be trained to quit leading and to follow. In the old life, I was the leader, which means I was functionally the Lord. I was God. Because whoever decides what to do is governing. If, if I decide to go to McDonald's instead of Burger King, then I'm the Lord of that decision. And whatever lords you is your God. Right? Does that make sense? So, in the old life, I was the leader. It was my flesh. I did what I thought. I did what I wanted. I did what I felt. It's my, you know, I just, it was, it was just me. But that all changed. Why? Because I put my faith in Jesus. And he moved in. And he likes conversation. It's called abiding. See, He likes communication. Pray without ceasing. So the new life, I'm a follower. I signed up to quit leading when I put my faith in Jesus. Did you, did you know that? that? That's what faith in Jesus is. Jesus, you show me, you lead, I will follow. That's hard work. Because I'm so used to doing what I think and what I feel and what I, my friends, that's hard work. It takes some spiritual growing up, maturing. Everybody say work. work. The work doesn't save you. You're saved by your faith in Jesus to have done the work for you in terms of external behavior. But internally, he doesn't force his will. He just... <laughs> and the sooner and the better and the more that you learn to listen and trust him by the two will become one and he'll save your life. I'm not talking about eternally. I'm talking about now. And there won't be two kings in heaven. Did you know that? There'll be one king in heaven. And who will be there? Those who decide on earth, you are Lord, you are king, not me. I submit to your government. I enter your kingdom. Every kingdom has a king and Jesus is king of the kingdom. A lot of theology there. Okay? So, in the old life, I walked by sight. I saw things, I came to conclusions, I acted on it. Or I heard things, I I relied on myself, I walked by sight. In the new life, I walk, yes, by sight, I still see and I can't help but be, I can't help but be influenced greatly by what I see. But in the new life, I signed up to deny myself, to take up my cross, that's die to what I see or what I think or what I feel. I, I, I die to that in order to say, Jesus What do you think? What do you want? And to learn to hear him that I don't see it yet, but it's called walking by faith, not by sight. So I can't help but be influenced by what I see and what I hear, but I'm to deny that in order to learn to say, Lord, what did you say? What did you think? I'm gonna believe you. I'm gonna walk by faith, not by sight, in spite of the fact that cancer, finances, physical problems, challenges, conflicts. I see that with my eyes and that could just overwhelm me. But I have decided to not let that rule me. I'm going to look to Jesus, the author and completer of my faith, and say, Jesus, I believe you. I walk by faith in spite of what I see with my eyes. I'm going to believe you until your power releases so I, what I see by faith becomes sight. 
We are the we are the keepers of the presence and the power of God in this sense. We can bring the kingdom of God, God's will, God's kingdom being done on earth as it is in heaven through our walking by faith, not by sight. And it's quite a while many times before faith becomes sight. And every time we quit believing, going back to living by sight, we slow down the conveyor belt that's bringing God's presence and power to us. Do you see it? Do you understand how important we are? Not just for our own life to be saved, but for those around us. We are partners. We are the bride of Christ to bring that which is only an idea or concept into reality through our faith and obedience. God and his, his bride, Jesus and his bride come together and are one internally so that it can become visible and tangible. And not only is our life saved, but others see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. We become the light of the world. We become salt. Giving you more time than I did the first service. Is that okay? (laughs) So the old life, I am Lord. The new life, Jesus is my Lord. Now, if you were heard it correctly, you should have been told that what it means to enter the kingdom of God is to change kings. Very, very few preachers preach that. And when we hear it, we don't have a clue what it means. But biblically, we literally need to hear the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. And the kingdom has a really good king and a really smart king and a really powerful king. And we're called to put our faith in that king. See, and and that means walk by faith. So, let's go here. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you've received from God? Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit? My mom, who made me go to church, I didn't miss church in my life once till I was 75 during COVID. <clears throat> my mom took me to church, and she told me, now we're going to God's house, so you need to be quiet and reverent in honor of God. It sounded good to me. So I tried, never could do it. I ran around, caused trouble, got in trouble, couldn't do it, but I heard, be reverent, be quiet. And then I learned that my dear mom didn't quite know enough about the Bible where in Acts 17, Paul says, God does not live in temples built by human hands. He said, you are the temple Do you know who you are? You're the house of God. He came to dwell in you. And so we are not just the body. We're not just the bride. We're the temple of the living God. And he lives in us. And our parents should have told us, be still. You've become a Christ follower. Be still. Go slow. Because you need to reverence the presence of God. We run, run, run. I do it, I did it. Go fast, scream. It's hard to hear God in the noise while you're running and pushing and stressed. There needs to be quiet because God is present in his temple and he speaks. People say to me all the time, I don't hear him. I say, oh, you do. You just don't recognize it's him. You wouldn't be a Christ follower without him speaking to you. He initiates the good but he doesn't force it very often. So that was huge. You are not your own. The next verse, 1 Corinthians 6.20. You are not your own. You've been bought at a price. Therefore, honor, honor. I'm talking about honor. It's honor. God. I want to honor everyone. Every one of you is worthy of honor because you're made in God's image. You're his children. Pro, potentially until you are actually by re, new creation, not just in original creation. <clears throat> but... I want to honor God actually as the ultimate honor. I'm not my own. I've been bought off the slave market. I I am truly been bought with a price. I don't own me. So therefore, it's not my thoughts. It's our thoughts. It's not my time. It's our time. It's not my money. It's our money. And I'm not the Lord. I'm the steward. Every thought. Bring captive into obedience. You hear this narrow way? I'm glad I got about 50 more years so I can kind of get to be one at more and more points. There's so many points that I'm not one with Jesus and I don't even know what they are. You do. I don't. About me. 
You don't know me that well, but if you had to live with me like Debbie does, you'd know him. See, we can all see each other's stuff. We all got, everybody say, I've got stuff. I've got stuff that has not yet transformed into the image of Christ. And it's a lifelong growth. An initial, I put my faith in you, Jesus, and that'll keep you working all your life to become one with Jesus, to work on the marriage. Amen. So you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God. Each one of these verses I'm going through is an hour-long sermon. I'm trying to hurry. Everybody pray for me that I'll work at shutting up, okay? (laughs) Here we go. I'm about through. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set Their mind is set on what the flesh desires. Those are non-Christians. Not us. Not us. Because those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. Now, let me just quickly tell you. You can't promise to be one with the Lord, but you today, you can set your mind today. You can, by an act of your will today, you can say, Jesus, my mind is set to have, keep my mind focused on what you desire. And if you'll set your mind to do that, you'll make a lot more progress in getting there. If you blow it off and say, well, I can't, that's too much. Well, then you got to deal with the rest of the Bible. But if, if, if you make this as a real clear, strong determination, you'll make progress. Because inwardly, God has said, set your mind on what the Spirit desires. And you can do that today. Every one of us can. I can decide to go to New York today. I'm not there, but I can decide. And if I'm heading toward Los Angeles, I'll start slowing the truck down to turn around. See? And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. Whoa. Jesus died for us that we wouldn't live for ourselves. Why? He kills us. Your selfishness, your pride will one way, sooner or later, it will end up destroying you. So Jesus died that we would not live for ourselves, but for him who died for us. So Jesus comes in to a selfish, messed up heart and to all kinds of things, including helping us to turn our motives from doing what I want or what I think, for my sake, into laying down our lives and saying, I'll live for him who died for me. I usually can't talk about Jesus without weeping because I've been with him a little bit and I know him and I love him deep. See, I'm starting to weep right now just thinking about Jesus. (laughs) I have history with Jesus and I, I have a picture in my mind about Jesus. It's my faith, but it's real for me. And so I can see that and I want And I have decided, I am determined. Jesus, no selfish motives are okay. Show me, because I'll slide into it. Show me, you're being selfish. You're living for yourself. Jesus, I repent. I hate it, because I love you. I hate it, but I didn't see it. Thank you for being the light in my life. You are my light. You are my life. Everybody say, thank you, Jesus. Because I don't want to live for myself, because you live for me, and I want to live for you, because we're married. And you're the love of my life. I still fumble and drop the ball and mess up. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me, if you remain in me and my words in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, and that doesn't mean as an unbeliever, as a pagan, But apart from me, that is, you think this and I think this. We're separated at that level. Apart from me, there'll be no good fruit. You cannot bear fruit. You want to bear fruit? Unite with me. It's about an internal relationship that's in the soil long before it's a tree that bears apples or peaches. And we look for peaches and apples when we haven't been doing the marriage work, the closet work the secret work internally with Jesus. Does that make sense? So you're in relationship with Jesus. He's here and we're all over the map. But he chases us. Say, I'm really glad. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on me when I'm tempted to give up on myself. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. And I say again today, I'm determined to repent. Every time... You talk to me about what is truth. 
that I don't recognize. Would you mind bowing your heads? Jesus, King Jesus, Lord Jesus, Master, Sovereign, Ruler of the universe. We desire or logically believe that the best thing we can do is to unite with you, to be one with you, not in general, but in specific. And thank you, thank you that you will be faithful to keep convicting me of right and wrong, good, bad, wise, dumb. You'll keep convicting me. And I, I make a holy resolve today to believe you, to change my mind. Keep repenting with the expectation that someday there'll be good fruit. But I'm not going to focus on the fruit. I'm going to focus on the root. It's our relationship. And may I just encourage you, be honest. Talk with Jesus now. Just pour out your heart about anything you've heard him say through me. If you're here today and the, you don't know Jesus, you've never made him Lord of your life, the most important thing you could do is to surrender your life to Jesus. And if you've called yourself a Christian for a long time, but you've really lived the single life, Maybe today you would surrender your life to him. Say, Jesus, today you are Lord. I am stepping down off the throne. And I ask you to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords in my life. That you would be the ultimate decision maker, the ultimate ruler. That I would truly start abiding in you. Not just part-time, but permanently. Lord, just help us to address the root. Thank you for Pastor Hal and Debbie coming to minister to us today. Amen. Amen.